Questioning Copernican Mediocrity. That is the title of an article with a subtitle, Modern Astrophysics Can Intimate Our Cosmic Significance, written by Howard K. Smith this year and published in the American Scientist which uh, unfortunately is not available for free on the internet, although you can buy the article. Uh, it is available at the Loma Linda University Library and also in the personal collection of Ariel Roth. Um, you may be saying, who is Howard Smith? He is a senior astrophysicist at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. So, you know, decent uh, academic credentials. Lecturer in the Harvard University Astronomy Department. Previously, he was the Chair of Astronomy at Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum. He also served as a visiting discipline science scientist in astrophysics at NASA headquarters. So, yeah, he knows his business. He starts out his article by saying, the Earth is not at the center of the universe, a conclusion we owe to the model of the universe created by 15th century mathematician and astronomer Nicolaus Copernicus. The inference that we are therefore cosmically ordinary is sometimes called the principle of Copernican mediocrity. Uh, you'll notice that he's being cautious about what he said. That's because he's going to show you that it's not actually accurate. Um, as 20th century astronomer Carl Sagan put it, we live on an insignificant planet of a humdrum star lost in a galaxy tucked away in some forgotten corner of a universe. Modern science has, like Copernicus, revolutionized the way we conceive of the universe and its findings are typically used to reaffirm Copernican mediocrity. Successes from cosmology to genomics have ev even infused many scientists with enough hubris to boast of our insignificance. We are so insignificant that I can't believe the whole universe exists for our benefit, said phys says physicist Stephen Hawking. His belief is not uncommon and derives from a worldview that presupposes such insignificance. With the further implication, ostensibly implied by Darwin's theory of natural selection, that humanity is the meaningless product of evolutionary processes. I want you to notice that this is pushing a theological agenda. It behooves us to beware of pre presuppositions, especially as 21st century science, from physics to biology, expands the ways we understand the world. The assumption of mediocrity can just uh, be just as misleading as the earlier belief of superiority. Even the historical paradigm of Copernicus toppling the earth from its pedestal is deceptive. Um, if you hear us complaining about that periodically, it's not because we're partisans, it's because it's the truth. Historian Dennis R. Danielson emphasizes that Copernicus and his contemporaries did not actually think that the sun-centered system pushed humanity into insignificance. On the contrary, the prevailing Greek and Christian views held that the earth was located as the 15th century Italian philosopher Giovanni Pico put it, in the excrementary and filthy parts of the lower world, where gross, imperfect mortal beings reside, as opposed to the heavens, which were perfect. Copernicus actually elevated us into equality with those heavens in, a, in an important way. By putting the sun at the center, Copernicus effectively elevated humanity to a place closer to the heavens. In the post-Newtonian world, however, the center came to be seen as a place of primacy, and a sun-centered system appeared to demote Earth to mediocrity. 
In particular, two dramatic recent developments in modern astronomy, the discovery of planets around other stars and the formulation of inflationary Big Bang cosmology, suggest we may not be so ordinary after all. It could be time to re-examine the notion of our mediocrity and if we might be special in some way, consider the ethical challenges surrounding the welfare of our planet. So he's going to get into a branch of theology interestingly enough. A fertile planet in a hostile universe. It took intelligent life roughly four billion years to develop on Earth. It is obvious that this gentleman is not a conservative Adventist. Um, we don't know the range of nurturing conditions that allowed intelligence to thrive. But we do know that our planet is unique within the solar system. Its salubrious environment should not be taken for granted. The cosmos is vast, however, and hosts a diverse array of worlds whose properties and capacity to host life we have now begun to study. If we really are ordinary beings, then at a minimum, intelligent life should be commonly found on other worlds. But as the physicist Enrico Fermi famously noted, if aliens are common in the universe, where are they? Only life capable of conscious, independent thought and ability to communicate between stars is under consideration. If only alien bacteria exist, then we are certainly not a mediocre species. The discovery of primitive life forms elsewhere in the universe would help us reconstruct how intelligence on Earth evolved. But unless a species can communicate with us, we will still be unique and alone with no one to teach or learn from no one to help us solve our problems, or, in the fanciful extrapolations of filmmakers, no one to battle with. To guess the number of possible extraterrestrial civilizations, scientists try to identify all the varied steps needed for life to arise, evolve, and mature to intelligence, and then assign a probability each step. This calculation is known as the Drake Equation, named after the American astronomer Frank Drake. It is a set of multiplicative factors used to track the various phenomena thought to be necessary to yield intelligent life. I'm not going to read the whole article. And when you see yellow ellipses, those are mine. There are occasionally other ellipses as well. Um, I'm going to stop reading the article here and go to one of their little sidebars where they give the Drake equation. N equals R times F, the fraction FP times N uh, times FL times FI times FC times L. And N is the answer that we want, the number of civilizations in the Milky Way galaxies with detectable electromagnetic emissions. R is the average rate of star formation in the galaxy. <laughs> Fp is the fraction of those stars with planets. And E is the average number of habitable planets per solar system. Might be more than one, but also might be less than one. Um, Fl is the fraction of those planets on which life can develop. Actually, to be precise, I think in the Drake equations, it's a fraction of those on which life, in fact, does develop. Because each one of these is a step to the next one. The Fi is the fraction on which intelligent life develops, as opposed to just any old life. Uh, Fc is the fraction that go on from intelligence to communication technology such as radio, and L is the length of time that such civilizations receive, release detectable signals. So that's the equation, uh, and those are mostly his, his descriptions verbatim. Um, come back to our paragraph, breakthroughs in exoplanet detection address one key term in the Drake equation the frequency of planets capable of nurturing extraterrestrial intelligence. Natural philosophers since the ancient Greeks have expected planets and life on them to be commonplace. 
just as an example, Percival Lowell, an astronomer famous for his claim that there were artificial canals on Mars, wrote in his 1908 book, Mars is the Abode of Life, from all we have learned of its constitution on one hand or of its distribution on the other, we know life to be as inevitable a phase of planetary evolution as is quartz or feldspar or nitrogenous soil. Each and all of them are only manifestations of chemical affinity. Unless you think that he was alone in that, I will remind you that uh, uh, there was a book put out by Dean Kenyon in his pre-intelligent design days called Biochemical Predestination and arguing that exact point. Chemical affinity made for life. Today, every school child knows that Mars has no artificial canals and no aliens either. Lowell's rhetorical confidence was based on presuppositions about life that no one would make today. Well, there are a lot of people who would like to make them, but, uh, but it's become pretty obvious that it is really, really unusual to get life. Other optimistic assumptions have been made, however. Just a few decades ago, textbooks taught that practically all modern mass stars hosted exoplanetary systems like our solar system with an Earth-like planet capable of burying intelligent species. As astronomer John Donald Goldsmith and Tobias Owen put in, it in their 1993 book, The Search for Life in the Universe, and this is common assumptions back then, Nothing in our theories for the origin and evolution of our sun is unique to the solar system. The chances seem good that one of these inner planets will orbit its star at the right distance to host life. We say one in every two to be conservative. And nowadays, I think you would have to say that is extremely liberal. So far, more than 3,600 confirmed exoplanets have been detected. The NASA Kepler mission alone, launched in 2009, has identified more than 2,300 of them. Many of these exoplanets have had their mass, radius, and other properties measured. NASA's Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, scheduled to launch in 2017, will find many more. The exciting discovery is not that exoplanets exist, it is that they are so varied but at the same time that exciting discovery destroys the idea that oh well there are earth-like planets around every star in assessing whether a planet can nurture life the usual starting assumption is that it needs liquid water and therefore should orbit its star in the habitable zone the so-called goldilocks distance not too hot not too cold at which the planet's surface temperature allows water to be liquid so far, dozens of exoplanets have been found in their habitable zones. Astronomers extrapolating from the statistics of exoplanets discovered to date have concluded that, at least for some classes of stars, there is likely to be an exoplanet in its habitable zone. Five dramatic recently discovered exoplanets called Proxima Centauri b, Trappist-1e, Trappist-1f, Trappist-1g, and LHS 1140b are orbiting dwarf stars, a class of stars fainter than the sun, whose surface temperatures could permit liquid water to exist. There are, however, significant limitations for life on these planets. Planets orbiting small stars have habitable zones that lie very close to their star because of the cool temperatures of those stars. Even though it is in the habitable zone, a planet in this close region tends to have one side perpetually facing the star, a situation that is called gravitationally locked, leaving half the planet in, in the dark and half constantly illuminated. This class of cool small stars known as M dwarfs have an interior circulation that is almost entirely convective. That means parts of the star come up from the center and other parts go down to it to cool the center off. Um, transporting upward hot gas from the deep interior. In contrast, the sun only has convection in its surface layers. 
the sun inside is pretty much just mass and convection. This type of circulation in M dwarfs leads to coronal flares, X-ray emission, and strong stellar winds, all of which might be hazardous to life on a nearby planet in the habitable zone. I think fair to say would be hazardous. Um, for example, the planet orbiting the cool star Proxima Centauri, the closest star to the sun, has an orbital period of 11.2 days and is close enough to be in the habitable zone, making it a prime target in the search for life. Think about that. It's orbiting a star that is uh, smaller than the sun, and yet it goes around the sun in 11.2 days, where Mercury, our closest planet to our sun, takes 88 days or something like that which means with less gravity, it's going close to uh, eight times as fast or and having a period of eight times as small. That is close. But the star's active flares, winds, and X-ray radiation may well have stripped away any ocean or atmosphere on the planet. The habitable zone requirement is only one of many conditions necessary for an exoplanet to host intelligent life. A now discusses rare earth, why complex life is uncommon in, common in the universe by Ward and Branley, who some of you may have run into. The right ingredients are also needed. He's gonna discuss a couple of requirements for life. Yet the chemical elements are not uniformly abundant throughout the universe. You need a, the right material of the star in order to have a planet that can support life. Then also essential is an environment that remains stable for billions of years. Now, of course, that wouldn't necessarily be true if you had a creation event. But then again, if you have a creation event, all of this speculation is kind of a waste of time. Orbital, he talks about orbital eccentricity, which determines the annual variations that the planet receives in st stellar illumination. In other words, when it's closer to the sun, it, or the star, it gets more. When it's further away, it gets less. And so you have a summer and winter kind of built in, even without a tilt to your rotational axis. as well as its susceptibility to gravitational orbital perturbations and disruption by other planets whose orbit might cross nearby. And that's particularly true if you have, as many of these systems do, a large inner planet, big, as big as or bigger than Jupiter, which has an eccentric orbit. And so if you have a nice, even if you have a nice circular orbit, but Jupiter comes out and gets you every so often, uh, you're going to have that orbit disrupted. You might even be thrown into the sun or perhaps into outer space. With an eccentricity of approximately 0 0.017, not quite 2%, the Earth's elliptical orbit is nearly circular. Only 5.3% of exoplanets currently listed by the extrasolar planets encyclopedia have an orbital eccentricity less than or equal to the Earth. Most of them are more elliptical. As the MIT exoplanet uh, scientist Sarah Seeger, and we'll see her name again, put it in her 2010 book, it seems that less than 10 to 20 percent of sun-like stars could hold solar system copies. Instead, astronomers have found that exoplanets and exoplanetary systems are incredibly varied, with planets of nearly all conceivable masses and sizes, as well as orbital separations from their host star. Scientists and journalists regularly describe new exoplanets as being potentially habitable. But in this early stage of the enterprise, such descriptions often mean that the planet is located within a star's habitable zone and probably has a rocky composition. 
In other words, not really habitable, just passing two major screens. So far, the focus has been on, on the exoplanet term in the Drake equation estimates for extraterrestrial intelligence. However, the equation's most uncertain terms are not astronomical, but it's three biological ones. The probability that life develops on a suitable planet, that it evolves to be intelligent, and that it survives a long time. Now here, Howard Smith is stepping outside of his uh, official expertise, although obviously scientists do get a broad education. As you'll see, he, he does okay at this. The formation of life, even in a perfect laboratory setting, and its evolution are the subjects of a vast and sophisticated literature. There's plenty of speculation about whether a civilization can survive for a long time as well. That is very polite language for <laughs> really is difficult to visualize how it works. And he's going to go on and, and attack evolution in that regard. Perhaps it is here is enough to note that the geneticists have concluded that the evolution of DNA on Earth was circuitous and probably included many fortuitous accidents. That's miracles in common language. Um, evolutionary biologist Stephen Jay Gould argued that evolution itself, at least on Earth, followed a very unlikely path with large brains by no means a guaranteed outcome. Although the same physical processes operated everywhere, some sequences of events, including biological ones, could be astronomically less likely to happen than others. That's a frank admission that it is highly improbable that life, now this is just to evolve, that doesn't count to create life in the first place. The evolution of intelligence could certainly be such a sequence. He's being careful about how he phrases that, but if you consider that possibility, it's pretty obvious that it was, in fact, highly unlikely without some kind of help. Communicating with aliens. It does not matter whether aliens thrive in the distant reaches of space. What matters is whether we know of their existence. So they sit there on the other side of the galaxy with the uh, main part of the galaxy in between us and them and we never communicate with them and they might as well not be there. Because most of our galaxy, not to mention other galaxies, is too far away for us to be able to imagine alien, uh, pardon me, image alien artifacts directly or to obtain other direct evidence of intelligent activity, the best method would be to look for radio signals. Until such signals are detected, we are just guessing about the existence of aliens. If the chances for extraterrestrial intelligence developing around a planet were just one in 30 million, we would probably be alone in this cosmic neighborhood. Before that, uh, he's given a calculation as to why that should be that low. Uh, Jill Tarter asserted in Science in 1983 that the only significant test of the existence of extraterrestrial intelligence is an experimental one. And a little further down in the article, he says, so far we haven't detected anything. Which means that, so far, the theory has failed. Even if the Milky Way galaxy has millions of water-bearing Earth-sized planets, and even if the formation of life were inevitable on every planet in the universe with liquid water, which of course are huge assumptions, the previous arguments suggest that we and our descendants for at least a hundred generations are probably living in solitude. The misanthropic principle, which is an interesting way of phrasing it, expresses the idea that the many possible environments in our cosmos are so varied and uncooperative or hostile, either always or at times, during the long gestation and maturation times apparently needed for intelligence, that it is unlikely for intelligent life to evolve and thrive. Life on Earth may not be ordinary. We may be isolated and truly alone. Cosmic fine-tuning 
but he, now he's going to expand his vision further. There is a second principle to consider. The physical constants of the cosmos seem to be remarkably fine-tuned to facilitate hosting intelligent life. Although any kind of intelligent life is implied, not just human life, this observation is almost always referred to as the anthropic principle. That is, referring to man. If the fundamental constants of the, uh, constants of the universe took values much different from the ones they have, constants such as the speed of light or the strength of four physical forces, gravitation, electromagnetic, strong and weak, we would not be here. The most extreme example of fine-tuning is the expanding universe in the inflationary Big Bang description of creation. Physicists estimate that if the balance between cosmic effects were different by only one part and 10 to the 120th power, we would not exist. Although there is disagreement about exactly how fine-tuned the constants really are, that's 10 to the 60th. Does it really matter? The anthropic principle has been contemplated for decades since theoretical physicist Paul Dirac first called attention to the curious balance between large cosmic numbers. Big number here, big number here, and they almost match. A universe fine-tuned to nurture intelligent life is the second piece of evidence for the end of our Copernican mediocrity. Why is the universe so suitable for intelligent life? It could be just dumb luck. Or as commonly proffered by theoretically minded scientists, there are an infinite number of universes also called the multiverse spanning all logical possibilities. We live in the universe we can, and an argument similar to the preceding one about the Earth being just right, just the, the one planet out of many where we can exist. The third answer touches on philosophy and quantum mechanics and is much more uncertain, controversial, and provocative. The traditional interpretation of quantum mechanics describes matters being composed of wave functions of probability that only become real entities when measured by an observer. Remember last week in the zero universe theory? They're not, the atoms aren't really real until we observe them. The quantum mechanical pioneer John Wheeler even championed the notion that the universe had to evolve conscious beings in order to become real. This notion, sometimes called the participatory anthropic principle, is still included in modern texts. That's because it's hard to refute it. It seems to be a cop-out to argue that we are lucky. He doesn't like the idea of we won the lottery 50 times in a row. And as a physicist trained to give preference to simple solutions, I find the multiverse explanation to be too exorbitant a solution. The quantum mechanical explanation is uncomfortably mysterious, but quantum mechanics has other mysteries too, so of the three solutions, it has the most potential. Still, the basic point is troubling, especially if one believes, maybe I should add if one wants to believe, in a reductionist worldview that presupposes our insignificance. Troubling because it suggests that something steers the universe towards intelligence and humans are representatives of that teleological endpoint. Intelligent design. If we might be the only such intelligent beings around, or the only ones that we will know about for millennia or longer, then we are more than just mediocre. We are special. Our 21st century perspective is very different from the 16th century one of Copernicus and his colleagues. We know about and can appreciate the immensity of space and time, the complexities of genetics and evolution, and the power of statistics. Even though the Earth is not at the center of the universe, its luxuriant environment could nonetheless make it a rare oasis. Perhaps we can appreciate that humanity too could be unusual, even special, and not mediocre, at least as far as we are likely to know for a very long time. Um, I'm going to comment about the 16th century outlook by referring to Ptolemy Almagest, Book One, 
This is, by the way, available online. And I'm going to point out that, that, that even here, our author has not completely um, digested all of the fallacies that go with the Copernican theory. Um, in fact, the ancients knew that the universe was essentially, for all practical purposes, infinite. This is book one, chapter six, and, and it is headed that the earth has the ratio of a point to the heavens. And the, uh, there's three paragraphs, so I'll just read the first one. Now, that the earth has sensibly the relation to, of a point, ratio of a point to its distance from the sphere of the so-called fixed stars, gets great support from the fact that in all parts of the earth the sizes and angular distance of the, of the stars at the same time appear everywhere equal and alike. For the observations of the same stars in the different latitudes are not found to differ in the least. You look out there and the stars are the same no matter where you are. If you are in Greece, if you are in Egypt, if you are in Spain. Um, not too many people went to India back then. But they looked out and saw the same stars too. Uh, this is, of course, a Eurocentric uh, proposition, but and we're talking about Eurocentric uh, uh, ideas, and uh, that the uh, it, it also argues, by the way, that the Earth is round. This is Ptolemy, the astronomical authority. So when people tell you that they had a f there, there, there was once a flat earth and the heavens were almost out there to be touched, they're full of it. I'm, there's no other way of saying it. Um, now, one can argue that, well, their infinite universe is smaller than our infinite universe because we can uh, extend them out further. Yes, but we also move faster than they did. You're talking about people who maybe got on horses and that was as fast as they went. Nowadays we get on jet airplanes. Some of us have gotten on rockets and gone all the way to the moon. Uh, maybe we see the earth as, as larger than they did, although then again maybe not. But it was essentially infinite to them. This idea that now we have discovered how big the universe is, that's bunk. But anyway, to come back to this, the end of Copernican mediocrity, the misanthropic principle raises es es epistemological and ethical dilemmas. The epistemological quandary is simple. Not knowing about the existence of extraterrestrial intelligence does not mean it does not exist somewhere out there. But until we hear a clear signal from beyond, or until science provides some conclusive argument, we are ignorant about putative aliens. In other words, we don't know. But it's certainly possible that either A, they're not out there, or B, we'll never make contact. The second dilemma is ethical. The Earth is under stress, and humanity confronts misery. It has taken 13.8 billion years of cosmic history to develop the rich biosphere that we enjoy and sometimes take for granted. If our world is just an evolved collection of atoms, then perhaps its future health and welfare are not a great concern. Although, tell that to people on Earth. Um, in a cosmos abundant in life, it is possible some alien civilizations will survive even if the Earth, the Earth does not. But the, if the human race, as far as we are likely to know for millennia, is singular, then we must consider the possibility that neither our planet nor ourselves are products of common happenstance. This thought adds urgency to the cause of protecting our rare planet and its precious inhabitants. Take care of the Earth, it's the only one we've got. Once the ideas of Copernicus took root and people realized the cosmic was not geocentric, they began to think about their new world, humanity and themselves in a new light. Building on the rapid advances of science after Newton, they concluded that because the Earth seemed or to be ordinary, humanity too was ordinary, mediocre. I would have to say they didn't really build on science after Newton, they built on their theology after Newton. Uh, 
uh, theology that denied the existence of a God, certainly denied his ability to intervene, and that that's what made them happy to get where they are. But your mileage may vary. Um, modern scientific evidence questioning Copernican mediocrity should initiate a similar process of self-appraisal. We, se we seem to be unusual, although it's likely we'll know how unusual, we, it's unlikely we'll know how unusual for a very long time. It is possible that we are just an accident, but conscious life does appear to be a remarkable and unanticipated achievement of the universe with attributes that are not predicted for an ensemble of atoms. The anthropic principle, at least in some interpretations, intimates that some necessary forces of feature of nature endowed the cosmos with this capacity, making it fundamental to the Big Bang and steering it over ends of evolution to produce conscious beings. If it didn't, then it raises the question how we got here in the first place. We are representatives of that teolo teleological endpoint. Keep in mind that this, in some circles, can be heresy. Writing about the impact of the discovery of exoplanets in 2010, Seeger, whom we mentioned before, and astronomer Jack L. Lassar made the claim that we will at last complete the Co Copernican revolution. We are on the verge of, if not in the very midst of, the greatest challenge and change in perspective of our place in the universe since the time of Copernicus, meaning we're really going to find out we're ordinary. Uh, perhaps their claim will prove to, but if honestly considered, that change of perspective is much more likely to be in the direction opposite to the one these authors imagine, towards reclaiming our exceptional status. The case for the end of mediocrity ne necessarily rests on incomplete data, statistics, and an admission that there are many things we still do not understand. We, that, that leaves room for faith in the opposite, by the way. Um, we might have to wait in ignorance for millennia before we have more complete stellar surveys indicating whether other civilizations are likely to exist. Even so, as we wait for more information about aliens or quantum physics, we should be able to acknowledge that the story is subtle and that there is compelling evidence that humanity is precious in spite of the theological bias. The earth, even, it is, even if it is not unique, is for all intents and purposes a special place. The implication of the anthropic principle is that it might matter the implications of the misanthropic principle is that we have to care for our planet and one another by ourselves without help from alien insights or technologies. Modern science has prompted this reevaluation, but addressing it re will require the best of all our human abilities. And that is the end of the article. Now, I think Smith takes aim at a modern myth, that is the Copernican principle, which is badly named, basically trying to hijack Copernicus's influence. We live on an insignificant planet of a humdrum star lost in a galaxy tucked away in some forgotten corner of a universe. The evidence really was never for that. But it's theologically attractive which is why it's being held. The myth is theologically motivated and it's dressed up as science, but it's not really science. Smith points out its scientific deficiencies. Now, Smith makes two arguments as I read it. The earth is special in and of itself and the universe in its basic physical laws seems to be planned. And of course, it does raise the question, by whom? He punts on the origin of life, evolution, and the origin of intelligence, although he does kind of point out that there are others who suggest that uh, that's also unlikely to have happened in the standard scenario. To be fair, he's an astronomer, so I don't, I, I don't expect him to make too much of the origin of life. 
Um, all I can say is it's a good thing he's not trying to get tenure, especially at uh, Iowa State. <laughs> uh, he might have been Gonzalized. Um, I find the arguments familiar, and I rather suspect that Ario Roth does too. Um, they are being put out on the official magazine of Sigma Xi, or Sigma Xi as they would say it, which is um, a professional society, which means that in some circles they are now being thought of as respectable. They are in fact respectable as long as they're not perceived as pointing to the Christian God. Um, and I think that's why the, uh, the intelligent design community gets almost as much opprobrium as, as do uh, short-age creationists because they confront people with a God who can intervene. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Ariel has read the article in question. <laughs> uh, I'll talk to you later about how you got the electronic form. <laughs> uh, but um, it, it seems to me here that uh, <clears throat> he's raising a question and I'm, that, that it got published is a little bit surprising to me, but uh, uh, and that there hasn't been a negative reaction to it, apparently. They, they did find an error in the article. <coughs> it was in the, uh, one of the photos where it said that the uh, 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 stromatolites in, uh, in uh, Australia were uh, only three... Uh, two to three uh, million mm -hmm. years old, whereas it really was supposed to be billion. Other than that, I, didn't, I haven't seen a reaction to it. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, the question that uh, arises uh, <coughs> from a broader perspective, and that is, if you're looking for truth and you have an open mind, and you're facing all these figures that, you know, we just keep hearing about it. Well, maybe one chance out of this and so on and so on. And right. Maybe there's enough multiverses around to possibly have that and so on. How long is the scientific community going to be happy with playing that game instead of asking, well, on which side is the weight of evidence? Uh, 10 to the 60 to 1, I'll take those <laughs> odds. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> We, we, uh, we claim, you know, we pride ourselves on being logical and all this. Uh, we're facing a tremendous illogical approach there that is so ingrained in the matrix of science that we don't recognize it. But it's there. It just faces us all the time in these areas. Yeah. So he, he's made mention is essentially of the of Fermi's paradox and that is well if there's some aliens that evolved out there then um, I mean he said if they're if we're too far apart whatnot we're not communicating you know it's what's the point you know um, I, I think the the Fermi paradox is it's a complex question of you know if if evolution can create intelligence life out there then those aliens should be able to have time. They'd certainly have the technology to be able to travel great distance and spread themselves throughout the galaxy. So the question is, where are they? Because shouldn't they be here by now? Um, and I really think that it's, um, it poses a pretty significant question on, on the assumptions about anything from the origin of life to, to developing intelligence um, in that it's quite reasonable to expect that, I, I think, to, to expect that 
aliens could be able to uh, develop super intelligence, like it almost looks like we're developing computers that might be able to go super intelligent, uh, and that they would be able to gain almost complete control over, over matter you know, at the nano scale. They could produce almost anything that they would imagine. So the idea that they would be able to not only spread, um, you know, travel at speeds approaching the speed of light, but uh, that they'd be able to replicate at destination and spread out from there, and you just have this, you know, almost like a bacteria in a petri dish sort of thing going on in the galaxy. Um, it really, I think, po you know, puts a, an exclamation mark or underlines the question of, you know, wait a minute, the, the, something's terribly wrong with the assumptions. Uh, and, uh, and I think he sort of gets into that in that that is one more argument that, you know, we are special because if we were not special and, you know, evolution is happening throughout the, even, even the local, like, clux, uh, <coughs> galaxy clusters, what, what, whatever it's called, the local cluster, you know, that those distances are traversable uh, at speeds approaching the speed of light within, you know, I don't know, few million years uh, and so it just you know I think underlines that something weird is going on here this is this is not a Copernican sort of situation yeah what I see is this is all being seen through a theological lens there are certain questions that need to be answered in certain ways and once you answer those questions in that way, why it tends to color everything you do, and and the and the data it really doesn't matter too much. That is to say, if <coughs> we are the only civilization in our corner of the galaxy, um, then it's evidence that we're insignificant. If we are surrounded by other civilizations that can communicate to us, and in fact, after a while do, it would then be proof that we're insignificant. And the conclusion that we're insignificant actually comes before the evidence for it. Um, and and part of what we're seeing, I think, is uh, people who want to be somehow insignificant. Probably because they, uh, then what they do is insignificant and nobody really cares, and so they can do pretty much what they want to. And I think that I think that, that is maybe not the only, but a major driving force behind this whole thing, including the hijacking of Copernicus. In fact, what you see is really this is leftover of the warfare thesis. You know, before Columbus, people believed the world was flat. And uh, now we realize the Earth is round, it goes around the sun, uh, and each time we think that we're in the center, turns out we're not in the center, we're not in the center of the, of the solar system, we're not in the center of the galaxy, we're not in the center of the universe, we're just a little tiny speck. And there's lots of other Earths out there. And they could have life. And in fact, some of them do, probably. And it's funny how this probably has such a, a, a force behind it when all the evidence we have is against it. <coughs> it's really, uh, and it doesn't make sense on a scientific basis. When you realize that there's, there's a theological agenda behind it, then it does make sense. I, I mean, these, these questions, um, you know, the, the, the rare earth and, you know, the probability of life and multiverse and all these sorts of things, I think uh, they're, they're well discussed in the literature and, to what extent do you think the scientific community actually believes the Copernican principle applies to us? I, I, it strikes me that there's just <coughs> so much re recognition that no, you know, 
the, the fact that they have to go to multiverse, I think, is evidence that they, they recognize that there's extreme improbabilities going on here. So, yeah. so what percentage of scientists do you think really believe in the Copernican principle? I don't know that I have good uh, survey evidence to say. Do you have any secondary, you know, any circumstantial guesses, educated well, guesses? The, the one that I found interesting was that uh, a survey was done of uh, scientists and they asked the question of, do you believe in a God who answers prayer? And by, by answering prayer, I don't mean just affecting your psychology. I mean actually doing something outside of you in answer to your prayer. Um, and the answer to that came out 40%. 45% did not. Which means that there is a substantial minority that believes that there's a God who actually can interact with you. That's substantial. Yes? I think it was a great article. I think um, he made a few mistakes in the article. He limited the mode of communication to electromagnetic radiation. And he limited the fact that we should start looking for it and we would find it out there. How, do, how, how can it be possible? I mean, it's possible that there are intelligent life forms that are communicating with us at such a high level, they don't need to use electromechanical or electromagnetic radiation. Perhaps these aliens are implanting thoughts into human beings already. Perhaps they've been implanting thoughts in human beings from the very beginning. You know where I'm going with this. Yes, I do. And if they were to look at the, some of the writings of some of these people that had these thoughts implanted into their brains from the beginning of historical history, they may find evidence that spans generations continents, centuries, and could only be explained by coming from one source. Yeah. And I, that goes back to the sanctuary. Yeah. Is it possible that there is a extraterrestrial that has been communicating with us all along through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit from the very beginning? And, and so what they've done is they've limited it's, it's kind of like the higher critics who look at the Bible. They start off with the assumption that there is no prophecy. And therefore, because the book has a prophecy in it, it must have occurred after the event. Yeah, yeah. And so by limiting, by him scientifically limiting the possible, how does he know that this life form has evolved so much, I'm putting it in his terms, yeah. that they don't need electromechanical radiation to communicate? Um. Because he's still operating in, in some senses within the, uh, you, you see him struggling oh, oh, against I know why it, he but does. he's operating within yeah. Yeah. a materialistic framework. Right. And but in it, but materialism, it's, you only have uh, four forces. But it, it limits his ability. Electromagnetic, yeah. weak strong and gravitational but and yet the, but yet there is scientific evidence that twins t there have been twin studies that show that twins can there seems to be some relation they, they react the same way in the same situations or something else other than and when they're not communicating through electromechanical radiation and so to limit that argument how do we know that i mean i'm putting it in his terms now how do we know that there's not alien life forms that can implant thoughts into your brain they're, they're already doing that now, actually, if you read some of the articles. They can, they can actually, with MRI and implants, they can actually put thoughts into people's heads. This is, this is not like the Inquirer. This is, this, is on, this is regular scientific stuff that they're doing. <coughs> well, it's, it's, it's regular until the, um, yeah. until the materials get hold of it, and then it suddenly becomes heretical. Of, of course. But 
the point is, the point is, is that if we really want to look to see if there is intelligent life, coming from an Adventist standpoint, coming from a, a Christian standpoint, we already know the record to look at and put it under that yeah. test. But you see, from a materialist, a Christian standpoint is already ruled out. But even if we treat it as literature, then, then yeah. the problem that you have is here is literature that is, that is, that is um, anthropological. Mm -hmm. Now you have to deal, you have two choices. You either deal with this pattern of, I'll, and I'll say it, the sanctuary, all throughout literature. You see it in the literature written by Moses. You see it in the literature written by just about every author over 1,600 years yeah. by 60 some yeah. odd different authors yeah. who never communicated with each other for the most part. These were written in isolation and they spanned two different major religions, each which had their own agenda, if you will. Mm -hmm. And yet you see it all throughout. You, I, this is either one big coincidence mm -hmm or something directed it. Yeah. I, I would uh, argue, let, let me just throw in a little explanatory. You, you mentioned my name up there about this. Uh, Jack Stout is sitting right behind me here. Uh, one of the statements he made to me, uh, I don't know, about 20, 15, 20 years ago, we're arguing about evolution and so on, how important it was. He said, he said, what those students out there are wondering about is whether or not there's a God. They said, you, you, you're, you're playing with <laughs> uh, uh, just minor things uh, when there's such an important thing. Then, then when I gave a lecture at UCR uh, uh, and we spent two hours after the lecture deciding whether or not there was a God, I decided to write the book. Uh, Science Discovers God, where, uh -huh. where I covered a lot of this stuff here. Uh, it's uh, nice to see it uh, semi-mainstream now. Yeah, well, it, uh, it's in 20 languages now. No, no, I'm talking about your argument going into oh, yeah, Sigma C. But or getting back to, to our... Uh, there's a danger here that we give up rationality. And I, I would argue for multiple possibilities and multiple areas, some that don't appear rational to us. But basically, we, we give up rationality. We've lost reason. We've lost, I think, I think we've lost cause and effect. Uh, the Bible is basically rational in its approach. Uh, you need to be careful how far you go here in, in these, in these uh, various things. And I, I, I argue for multiple survival of different kinds, mm -hmm. including quantum mechanics. Mm -hmm. Did you have anything to, yeah. <laughs> oh, I'd just say after a, a fairly extensive career with Adventist uh, science and biology students. Um, they're, they really, uh, we really need to hold on to rational explanation. The challenge is to find a rational explanation for things we believe happen supernaturally. And that is a huge challenge, but Opening up that approach, uh, and I had a number of years of direct experience with this, but really, at least for us, sent our biology majors out the door saying, yeah, I can hold on to my faith, even, even though everything isn't coherent. And I, I, we always found that as a very important goal. I would say the anthropic principle was a major factor in their coming to, the, to these conclusions, or at least positions, I guess is the right way. And most of them, I think, st are still staying tuned. Mm -hmm. Comment uh, behind you, then. In Canada, for a while, we had 13 grades in high school, or rather, high school ended with the 13th grade, for those who wish to go on to university level. 
And in that biology class, towards the end of the course, the teacher one day asked, how many believe in evolution? And I thought to myself, this is an odd thing. In all of the science courses, nobody ever asked how many believe in this or that. Gravity, Why is it that evolution requires a faith position? The, the, the short answer was that the number of hands went up in about half the class. The interesting thing was that the two top students, one a Jew and the other one an Adventist, were not in that group. <laughs> the question that struck me is that evolution position is also a faith statement. We have nothing to be ashamed of or embarrassed by. We, not knowing something is the normal thing. It is not, you know, when I was little, everybody said, oh, you have to know what you believe if you don't have an answer for every question that somebody levels you, you're going to fall. And I was thinking, that's ridiculous. Nobody knows everything. I mean, only God knows, so that means everybody else is fried. <laughs> How could that work? That, that kind of paradigm simply does not work, that type of thinking. I have learned some time ago that when you come up against a question for which you do not know what the answer should be or is, or a satisfying answer, you put the question in the back shelf of your mind. Perhaps you will encounter something that would be helpful at some point later. It's like a jigsaw puzzle. You pick up a piece, you have no idea where to fit it. Now, you may be tempted to use scissors and adjust it so that it will fit the hole. <laughs> But that's not going to work well because then you will have the wrong piece in the wrong place in two ways. <laughs> First, you have it in the wrong place where you put it. And second, it will be missed where it really belongs. <laughs> that kind of approach is simply yeah, not workable. We have to understand that we have to every day of our lives work with innumerable unknowns. At the end of the day, the reason why God sent his word to us and his spirit to us is not in order to give us an answer to every question, but it is as a manner of hints to point us to where the answers may be found where it is worth digging, rather than digging all over the place in vain, and you know, life is short, problems are big, you will never answer all the questions. We will probably never answer all the questions anyhow. However, at least with a clue, it is a, a more likely pursuit to, to have some measure of success. Mm -hmm. May we find that God is trustworthy as opposed to other options. Yes. A few minutes ago, you, I thought, cut to the chase about why it would be that this mediocrity is so attractive to many. Um, and I was trying to look up the quote. It was Aldous Huxley, and I couldn't find the exact quote, but it was he was honest enough to admit why he wanted this life to have no meaning and that it was because it freed him to his political and erotic desires. <clears throat> and uh, I think you also mentioned that um, in essence this is a theological problem and I think that's correct because these people re want to reject, do everything possible to reject the involvement of a God I think because they think that God always means uh, what they've known of God through the Dark Ages and 
uh, what's been told to them, what God is like through man's inhumanity to man. So our picture of a God whose character is beautiful seems to me so relevant to these questions. Um, I'm not, I don't consider myself to be a scientist, so I'm afraid to even make a comment, but um, I'm really interested in like psychology and social psychology and um, earlier this year thinking about creation and evolution um, one of the things that kind of came to mind is that um, if if evolution is promoting an idea that you know that minimizes the worth of human beings and yet human beings are fundamentally wired to love and experience love then um, the most compelling argument for creation would be helping other, uh, potentially helping other people to feel valuable. Because if you can awaken a sense of value in someone, um, there's no one that isn't wired to feel that, even though that process has been hijacked by deception. So I think it's, um, it's interesting how like you know in the early church how their massive focus on welfare and um you know just seeing the dignity in other people it created a space in which um people that weren't christians at least respected um christians like i was studying this past week about what some of the roman um, historians said about the way that the early Christians were caring for the community and I wonder like there has to be a, a kind of a marriage of um, like creationism creationist thought with um, with service in order for it to be taken seriously at large because if we can show people hey the reason why we're actively engaging in the lives of the people in our community is because we believe they're valuable because we believe we're all created, or it's the reason why we stand up for marginalized people or um, stand against violence is because of this. But it seems that often there's not space for those kinds of conversations in the debates. And maybe I'm wrong. I just never really heard it. So um, anyway, I'd be interested to know more about uh, about that because it seems to me that when there's debates about creation and evolution, they're largely like. Um, intellectual debates and and it's hard for some of the why to come in where the why might be what could like reach the core need well, I think you're hitting on a central point um, the Copernican principle is very nice if you need to be absolved from responsibility it is not very nice if your neighbor needs help and you use it to say, but it doesn't matter because he or she is going to die anyway and uh, it's going to discomfort me too much to, to deal with him, um, uh, and now it is fueling a, a lack of care for your neighbor. Um, and I notice in the article that we were reading that he was kind of gently pointing it towards if we're unique, if we're special, and our earth is special and we need to take care of the earth. And I think if you were to push him a little bit, he would say, and that includes the people on earth. Um, and you know perhaps his idea of the ideal care is is a little different from some of ours um, but in the areas where we where we see conciliantly i think that uh, it would actually uh, enable us to to unite on those areas um, and i do think that uh, uh, that if all we really care about is whether creation happened, I think we're missing the boat, that the whole reason that creation matters is that there's a God who cares about us and who expects us to care about each other. And also him. But, but the, you know, the two commandments are united. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy soul, 
all thy strength and all thy mind and and thy neighbor as thyself and if we if we get to where we separate those two I think we've missed the boat don't forget in the heart of the Lord's Prayer we have forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors pointing us out uh, that we need to be uh, we need to take the fact that we have a God and the fact that we have a gracious God and turn it around into and therefore we treat other people differently if that happens I don't see any force actually stopping uh, the church from fulfilling the mission that God intended for it um, one back there and then here uh, thank you for pointing that out you to put it just more starkly on one hand we have the option where there is no meaning no purpose no freedom. On the other hand, we have the recognition of love which gives us both freedom and purpose and meaning. It is up to us what we choose. And we have a comment down here. That was such a beautiful comment. Um, Christ said, who is my neighbor? Someone asked him. That one of the disciples, and he gave a beautiful story. Uh, beautiful, beautiful story. Uh, and then we we look at it. Well, we have 5,000 people. Uh, they're hungry. We need to send them home. Let's send them home quickly. Uh, what do you have? Oh, the kid has five loaves of bread. Okay, let's feed them. Jesus was so compassionate, so very compassionate. The reason why oh, Mother okay. Teresa got international attention um, was because she went to the place in Calcutta where no one else would ever, ever, ever go. Um, yes, she bowed down to Buddha and all kinds of things, you know, but uh, her other side of her life. But um, uh, the cardiologist uh, says, my son went uh, and spending time with um, friend of mine uh, with Mother Teresa says, well, how does it work? You're Hindu and uh, he says what Mother Teresa is doing uh, transcends any religion, you know. And uh, they, they, they were Muslims and Hindus and it uh, doesn't matter going and serving there with her. Um, what a beautiful work the Lord has given us Adventists you know, to be able to reach out to very intelligent people and poor people, downtrodden, forgotten, forgotten people. Uh, what, what a beautiful, beautiful uh, movement that we belong to. And it, it's up to us really, truly really personally also to reach out. Um, this is one more comment. Uh, you, you talking about, uh, you mentioned a couple of times um, extraterrestrial uh, UFOs and there was a time when I used to travel late 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 at night and to stay awake after a hard shift I'd be listening to uh, there was an AM station and uh, you might have heard some of you and very intelligent people would call yes I saw that UFO so I thought maybe i would ask you, you know, if you want to make a presentation or even make a comment, <laughs> where do we go <laughs> with this one? Um, that's an interesting question. Uh, one of the things that kind of surprised me is that irreligious people actually have a higher belief in UFOs than religious people, and I was rather stunned by that survey. But. Uh, um, I guess we'll have to, maybe that's a question for another day. <laughs> so, um, anyway, uh, I think we'll allow Leonard Brand to close the uh, discussion. <laughs> well, uh, this question of, um, if we're dealing with creation and evolution, maybe that's a minor issue. The real question is, that the people want to know is, is there a God? Well, I have a suspicion 
that even though there are various factors that can influence that, evolution might have a lot to say about why people don't believe in God. And so I don't think it's a minor issue. I agree. I agree. In fact, I would go so far as to say evolution was designed to have that effect. But anyway, uh, come back next week. We're going to look at a new take on Joshua's long day. It happened in 1207.